for the sake of time and respect for everyone's really busy schedules. I know folks will continue to join us as they come off of other meetings. Uh, and uh, many of us are familiar with the back-to-back -back Zoom realities. Uh, so uh, Ms. Natalie, if you will go to the next slide for me, I would appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, make sure that you are muted when you're not speaking. Uh, this meeting is being live captioned and uh, we're asking if you have public comment to be ready to dial the number on your screen there. There's also a number for you if you are having technical difficulties, uh, they can give you some assistance with getting into the meeting. Next slide, please. I know that uh, <laughs> we didn't formally introduce, but you all are noticing these lovely and beautiful new colors uh, and um, the new uh, logo. Um, I want to introduce to you, uh, <laughs> uh, as many of you were a part of this process, uh, the new I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project logo. Mira has joined us and she was very intricately involved in working uh, with us and PDX Black Excellence. Um, I'd love to have her just come on just a moment and share uh, a brief word. You are muted, Miss Mira. I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Happy Black History Month. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, take this time to introduce the new brand. And um, by first acknowledging the discovery process that many of you were involved in with, um, with the lovely and talented Jessica Stanton, principal of Jessica, um, principal of Stanton Global Communications. She um, spent, she told me about the time that she spent with many of you getting your stories and um, just to thoroughly inform this process of developing a new, not only a new logo, but a new brand overall. And um, just thank you for uh, generously giving your time, hearts and minds to th that process. And, um, and later she passed the baton to PDX Black Excellence. And um, they are a collective, they are a creative uh, collective of of um, made up primarily of black men who are um, of the younger uh, Gen Z millennial group, very young, a lot of creative energy and um, founded by Raylan Jones. He's a Portland based entrepreneur and events manager with uh, a profound passion for connecting people. And uh, his partner, Jaron Simmons is a Yelp trained graphic designer who spent years in Brooklyn running a design studio and now he's here in the community and um, he's a multimedia artist too. So we um, were very fortunate to connect with them and develop um, further uh, develop this new brand that we're seeing here today. And um, I'm going to share the style guide that Jaron uh, shared with us here in the chat in a moment. But um, I just wanna say it's one of the most comprehensive and best style guides I've ever seen. And my standards are high. I cut my teeth at Essence Magazine. So you can't tell me nothing when it comes to design. So I was very impressed by Jaren's work. I'll share it with you all. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, reach out to Erica who can um, reach out to me with um, who can you know, address any questions about the brand. But the logo is lovely. The pho photography style is fabulous. And we're working on a new website, which we can't wait to uh, roll out this spring. So. I'll pass it back to Erica and I'll place the style guide in the chat. Thanks, Mira. You know what, Natalie, if you could go back one slide, I think there is a bit of a clearer version. One more there at the beginning. So you all were intricately involved in this um, rebranding ideal from the beginning uh, to um, choosing a concept. And so we want to just Thank you for the input. We hope that this is infusing uh, new life into um, our time together, our commitment uh, to doing something different uh, with this project. So thanks again for your participation in this uh, process. All right, if you could forward the slides for me, thank you. So today, uh, uh, back one slide, please, Miss Natalie. We are going to have a time for public comment. Uh, then we're gonna have some project updates as we normally do, with some exciting news uh, to share with you today. 
Uh, and then we will dive further into some design updates, uh, some information around early work packages A and B uh, before we end our time together. So next slide, please. Our principles of agreement, uh, your voice matters. And uh, if anyone notices the change here, be authentic and genuine. We are hoping that you will continue to bring all of your authentic self into this conversation uh, and to listen for understanding, uh, to deal with the issues and not with people. Uh, often in such a passionate environment and our hearts towards our community, uh, we may experience some discomfort, but we ask that you would remain respectfully engaged and we can't solve everything today, but we're hoping that each time we get together that we are moving the dial forward. So we're asking you to expect and accept non-closure, but to continue to work collaboratively uh, as we advance uh, our community. Next slide, please. With that, we're going to have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, Mira, will you be helping me with the public comment this evening? I, I can, but I don't want to um, step on Natalie's toes. <laughs> okay, Miss um, Natalie. I, I think it's Natalie. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you so Either much. Either way, okay. no worries. I'm prepared to do it. So. Everyone is so eager to participate and help. I appreciate you all. Miss Natalie. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Mira. Thank you, Erica. Um, at this time, members of the public are um, invited to make a verbal public comment by phone at this time. Um, if you wish to do so, please dial the phone number shown in the upper right corner of the slide. And then when prompted, enter the meeting ID and passcode shown below it. After doing so, you'll be placed in a virtual waiting room until your turn to speak. And when the time comes, we will invite you to unmute yourself and speak your comment. Speakers will have up to two minutes for their comment and will be muted at time. And if you'd like to provide more extensive comments beyond the two minute limit, um, there to the members of the HAB, please see the options listed on the meeting agenda. And if you are joining us on the live stream, uh, please remember to mute your speakers to minimize feedback. And with that, I'm looking to see if there are any um, members of the public in the waiting room indicating that they would like to make a comment and I'm not seeing anyone in the waiting room at this time. So we can just give it a one more moment, Erica, and then uh, see if anyone joins and um, that sounds good. Great. And I am still not seeing anyone in the waiting room. Thank you, Miss Natalie. Well, then we can go to the next slide. Uh, for those who may join us who are at another time, would love to give pub public comment. There are many ways to do so. Uh, please take a look at the agenda and avail yourself to those instructions. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our project director, Ms. Megan Channel. Thanks, Erica, and good afternoon, Hab. Good to see you again. Um, we've got a couple updates uh, today. Um, I'm going to start with an update on the environmental process, um, and then I've got some good news to share uh, going forward as well. So um, by way of the environmental review process, um, I think since our last meeting, uh, there has been an update uh, to how we're proceeding with, um, with this um, as it relates to carrying forward the proposed Hybrid 3 highway cover design concept. So as you know, ODOT and the Federal Highway Administration uh, were moving forward as we expected to do an updated environmental assessment process for the proposed Hybrid 3 concept. Um, the modified project design um, with hybrid three does require that additional study by up updating our environmental review. Uh, I think since our last meeting, and I know I sent an email out about this as well, and I'll address that in a second, but um, since our last meeting, the original um, environmental decision document that was published by the Federal Highway Administration, uh, which is the finding of no significant impact, was rescinded. Uh, what that means is that um, the prior federal approval for the baseline project um, will now be updated with this new and updated um, environmental assessment process that we are going through to evaluate the proposed hybrid three um, highway cover design concept. So it does, um, it does extend our environmental review schedule uh, by about five to six months. So originally we were expecting our updated environmental review to be done in summer of 2022. Uh, we now will be complete with that at the end of this year. 
That said, I know one of the main priorities uh, from this group, in addition to what the hybrid three uh, cover concept brings forth by way of outcomes for the community, is also making sure that we stay on schedule related to the urgency for jobs now um, and those construction and career pipeline opportunities that the project brings as well. So even with this updated environmental review process, we do stay on schedule to start construction um, by late 2023. So again, it's a process we always knew we had to go through, uh, but with the recent information and correspondence with our federal partners at the Highway Administration, uh, we now have just more certainty on um, what that process is. Uh, I also want to acknowledge um, that you got um, an email from me, uh, likely moments before media hit. Um, and so I just want to apologize to you and probably how abrupt that was. I don't feel like we gave you um, adequate time as our partners on the HAB um, to have that information and the context before you were seeing it hitting the media. Um, so for that, I just want to um, apologize our, our efforts going forward. Uh, we will do better. For that particular one, uh, we were operating with a lot of information coming in very quickly from our federal partners, but regardless, um, as important community partners on our work forward, um, we're going to do our very best to make sure you're getting that information in advance um, of the media flurries. So thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for um, the pivots <laughs> that, that you're working through with us um, on that as well. Um, by way of good news, I also want to share, I know I've been kind of giving updates on the governor's letter of agreement, and I feel like maybe I stole my own thunder by sending an email out in advance of this meeting, but the governor's letter of agreement uh, is signed and finalized with um, the governor's office, city of Portland, Metro, and Multnomah County, really codifying that support for um, incorporating the proposed hybrid three highway cover design concept into the project. So uh, this is a really exciting moment, uh, not only for the project, but I think for, um, for the HAB, for this group, uh, that that recommendation uh, that you helped carry forward in your leadership through that process is now framed up in that agreement. So thank you to each and every one of you um, for your hard work through that process. What this means for us going forward is um, that that letter of agreement kind of um, sets the stage for us to take the next step for re-engaging partners and specifically City of Portland um, and kind of stepping forward with developing the intergovernmental agreements. Um, so we're actively working with the City of Portland um, to put that intergovernmental agreement together. And that's the space where really the specific roles, responsibilities, um, kind of details of the work program will be outlined going ahead. So I'll keep you updated as that IGA continues to be developed, but some exciting news um, and a step forward as we move as we move this important project forward. Um, I also just want to hit really quickly on two other items, uh, finance plan and performance measures. Um, by way of finance plan, just a um, kind of another quick update, we were set to deliver that to the Transportation Commission last month at their January meeting. With the continued uncertainty at the federal level um, around um, potential funding programs, um, as well as the Commission's ongoing conversations relative to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and some policy setting that they're taking on this spring, we wanted um, to hold and wait until there was more certainty and we were in sync with um, the commission's um, policy around how um, the new infrastructure bill funding would be programmed. So um, that uh, delivery has been delayed. We'll be working with the commission once we have more certainty on those items. We'll also have the benefit of learning more about the project with the proposed hybrid three highway cover design concept as we carry forward the environmental review this year. Um, so with that, we'll even have more certainty on what the project is um, as we deliver that forward. So more to come. And again, a commitment to keep the HAB in the loop as that finance plan progresses. Um, and then speaking of keeping you in the loop, I um, just want you to know by way of performance measures, I know that we've had a lot of um, touch points with you in developing those um, both in these meeting spaces and our um, de design collaboration spaces. We're continuing to get some feedback and coordination, doing some coordination with the Community Oversight Advisory Committee. Um, and so in that work, we're incorporating their feedback as well, and they'll be coming back to you as the HAB to help inform the goal setting. So more to come um, in the coming months on those performance measures as well. 
So with that, um, Eric, I'll turn it over to you, but I'm also happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, while we have the opportunity, would love to uh, see if there are any questions for Megan in regards to her updates. Anyone on the HAB have comments or questions in regards to what you just heard? Yes, Erica, Kevin Modica here. I do have some okay. questions, how are you? Yes, sir, um, good to have you. Specifically, thank you. Um, how does this connect with the recent announcements, at least on the other side of the state border about the interstate bridge crossing? Um, particularly uh, since there's been conversation and commitment uh, towards doing comprehensive review. How does what is going on with the Rose Quarter I-5 project and the commitment towards the interstate bridge concept. How does this link up? Are there going to be delays? Is it going to be concurrent? Uh, maybe Ms. Channel can address that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So the, uh, the efforts that we're taking as part of the Rose Quarter project by way of the um, environmental review process um, and analysis um, that's going to continue to carry forward on our schedule, um, sort of separate and distinct from the interstate bridge replacement program. Um, that program continues um, to maintain their schedule um, and, and process forward. We are, we remain coordinated, um, but the actions that we take as part of the Rose Porter project are really separate and distinct from the actions that are being taken as part of the interstate bridge um, replacement program. That said, we know that the two efforts combined can have a significant impact, along with investments in multimodal um, elements and the Oregon Toll Program. All of that is playing together to really address our regional transportation needs, too. So I thank you for that. I, I think my, my question still looms, right, because there's concern uh, from the constituency about both projects and the impacts. And so, you know, there's multiple layers, such as uh, moving Tubman, such as the environmental impact statement, such as other design uh, components that are going to impact uh, inner Northeast and North Portland. Um, so I, I know that the Rose Quarter money has been set aside for previous funding, but um, is there going to be any added delays that you can forecast with the interstate uh, bridge crossing issue still on uh, the table? Yeah, and again, that's a good question. Um, I wish I wish I had a better crystal ball for that. That said, um, knowing what we know today, uh, you know, for for the Rose Porter project, you know, we aren't foreseeing any any further delays, uh, we know that we have a lot of work ahead of us again um, for the environmental assessment process and review. And, um, you know, Kevin, answering a lot of those questions that you pointed out to make sure that we're, um, you know, addressing the community questions that are coming up around the environmental effects. Um, simultaneously, I know Interstate Bridge is working on that as well. Um, both projects, uh, both are still in need of funding. Um, and so we're continuing to kind of work with federal partners um, and kind of see what those different options may be um, by way of funding. But to, I guess, directly answer your question, as it stands today, uh, we remain on, on schedule. Um, and as, as far as I know, the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program also um, is kind of maintaining their schedule, um, given a lot of the questions that we still have to answer. And once the I-5 Rose Quarter project uh, begins, will there be a um, grandfathering in of the HAB um, for considerations of what those impacts are gonna be with the crossing project, or is that gonna be a whole new committee structure set up? And starting over, will the contractors that do the work for I-5 Rose Quarter be automatically qualified for the bridge crossing work or will it be a new process? And I promise I'll stop there. No, 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 these are really good questions. I, I appreciate it, Kevin. Um, what I'll say is, uh, you know, the, the HAB has been stood up specifically for the Rose Quarter project. 
Um, that said, I think we can all acknowledge that your leadership expands beyond just the um, you know 1.5 mile segment that is the Rose Porter area. Um, I do know that the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program uh, does have their own kind of separate and distinct uh, community engagement and advisory committee process. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know enough to be able to speak to that, um, but I can I can commit to at very least having taking that comment and question forward um, to see how the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program um, is considering their in engagement moving forward. I appreciate that, and I think it would be important for both groups to meet or have some type of relationship with one another, as I'm sure the same concerns uh, exist on either end of um, I-5 corridor through Northeast and North Portland. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that that feedback and um, kind of bringing forward the broader kind of regional perspective in that, too. So thank you. And prior to Ms. Sharon Gary Smith, I'll also say so. Um, and my colleague, John L. Bell with Espousal Strategies is key to some of the uh, community engagement on the Interstate Bridge Replacement Program. And we have been um, all along talking about how we can work collaboratively, knowing how small our community is here uh, and that uh, leaders are pulled upon in, in so many different areas. And so um, Mr. Modica, just know that, that um, along with uh, Megan's uh, carrying forward, we are trying to make sure that there is a, uh, a, a seamless collaboration uh, in, in regards to um, all of these investments uh, in this area. Uh, with that, I'd like to call on- Ms. I appreciate Shane. that. Yes. I appreciate that, thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Sharon Gary Smith. I will say thank you so much, Kevin, because now he has taken most of what I was thinking and wanting to ask, and he was very specific and direct. Um, and I think that as we are creating new ways of engaging, of influencing, and of determining what happens in and around our communities to the greatest benefit in these times, that I would hope that not only is it taken back by an official of the organizations that are engaged, I'm speaking specifically of ODOT and then the I-5 corridor, and then we're talking about the interstate bridge and that, that there be a very strong recommendation from the HAB that the engagement of communities that are not competing, but want to cooperatively realize what we haven't up to this moment, that it be a recommendation that an opportunity and opportunities be granted for us to hear, for us to verify the recommendations that are similar and even those that might be different, that we want to influence and inform whatever happens along I-5 all the way up to and crossing the interstate bridge and the implications of that. Maybe it can be a large Zoom meeting, maybe it can be a, a number of them, but that engagement should be carried forth soon and quickly so that it is not something that has to be inserted as we get farther down the road. We know how government processes work, even with the idea of more equity. And so what I appreciate is that the NAACP, we have a representative on the equity body of the I-5 and many of the questions and the very clear statements that Kevin Modica made are being raised among members. There's not necessarily agreement in all of it. There's not always cohesion. We've experienced that. But the fact that those issues are raised, it would be wonderful to see how much in sync and alignment we are and in the places that we're not so that we get to the end and are able to look back at we got what we came for. And so I would really encourage if we need to sign on to something as the HAB, um, we've been having wonderful opportunities with the governor, with the state. And so I would like to see that either as a model or something that is implemented and continues to get to the goals that we have. Thanks so much, Kevin, for setting it up. You're welcome, my sister, thank you. And thank you for listening and hearing. Megan and Erica always. Absolutely. And, and kind of feeding, 
feeding off of that as well, and kind of Kevin to your your questions kind of around the environmental process and funding too. I think you know moving forward, um, a way that the HAB and, and the COAC um, can get involved too is you know as we're looking for that support from elected officials and expressing interest and in ensuring that the Rose Quarter project or investments in I five. Um, you know, are in line with, you know, the federal funding opportunities. I think there is an opportunity for the HAB and the COAC as well, either separately or in partnership um, to provide, you know, a letter of support um, or communication in the future to kind of expressing the priorities and recommendations um, of this group um, and the community as it relates to how we move the project forward too. So I know I know that Tia Williams was with us uh, several meetings back and um, I think maybe started to um, identify this as an opportunity, but I'll bring that back to the table as well, um, if that is something of interest um, for the HAB uh, to carry forward as well. Thank you, Megan, appreciate that. Um, Miss Natalie, if you will put the slides back for us. Uh, I know I may not do it justice, um, uh, my sister Amber is uh, not with us today. Um, she is attending to some personal issues, but I wanted to just alert you all that on this week on the 17th, uh, the COAC will be celebrating the finalization of their diversity plan uh, and uh, adopting that. And so that is a really exciting as other uh, um, colleagues and members of the community um, have been laboring uh, with the CMGC and with the project leadership and with ODOT around what uh, the diversity plan would be. And so they're gonna have a celebration for that on uh, 17th, uh, which is on Thursday to adopt that. So we wanted to highlight that uh, this evening. Uh, if you all uh, have capacity to join them, uh, please do so. Next slide, please. I think we can go to the next slide. With that, uh, I am going to be turning it over to my colleague, Steve Drahoda, and we will be talking through uh, some of our uh, design updates. Steve? Thank you, and good afternoon, HAB members. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to speak with you, so I'm glad to be here. Before I turn it back over to James and the rest of the urban design team to really dive into some of the details that we'll provide an overview for with this update. So, um, I'm gonna talk about two things. First, a little more detail to that environmental review process, that update that's happening. And Mr. Modica, I heard your question and I'm hopefully I'm gonna answer with a little more detail about exactly what is this project updating and what does it mean? More of a focused project look as opposed to the uh, composition of projects that ODOT is running with, but hopefully this provides some of that detail. And then ultimately, what is this project gonna be building and how is it gonna be built? Um, in different phases called work packages. So those two topics, and then I'll get off the stage and then let the fun continue to happen with the actual detailed design elements. So next slide, please. So we'll first talk about that environmental review process that's updated that Megan referred to a few minutes ago. We can go to the next slide. I'm gonna start with our overall corridor look. So this, like you guys all know, is our project quarter limits highlighted in, in red. North is up, so as you extend north, you would extend into the interstate bridge replacement project. But really, we're just talking about what the project limits are for the Rose Quarter Improvement Projects and then how it is being impacted by the changes that frankly, the HAB was um, right in the midst of throughout last summer, leading to that highway cover option that we have now, the Hybrid 3. Uh, cover option, which is right in the dead middle of this picture that shows those series of green intersecting streets that run across I-5. So as we go to the next slide, the original environmental assessment um, led to a, an FHW official finding of no significant impacts, the FONSI, uh, but it was based on a highway cover that's different than where the hybrid three landed. And the highway cover that it originally had in it was actually two separate highway covers um, split by some amount of space. In this graphic, it was split by this triangular voided section. So it didn't really have the opportunity to complete all of the important uh, opportunities for improvements on top of the highway cover that the, that the hybrid three option led to. 
So this is what was based in the original environmental assessment. And so the question, as we go to the next slide, is how did that environmental uh, process, the environmental review change by having the hybrid three concept, which is now shown on this page. Um, this change in the hybrid three concept, and this is what Megan was referring to when he said, we always anticipated that it would result in some form of change. Well, FHWA said, you know what? Instead of just augmenting um, through the, the FONSI, rescind the FONSI, go back and update the reports to properly reflect what this new highway cover was, plus some of the other streets that connect into it and the way that the, the whole project really changed because of this really important hybrid three concept that was implemented. So what does that mean? Well, let's go to the next slide. So number one, the, the largest, most obvious change is the fact that the highway cover itself was both lengthened along I-5. So you can see the darker sort of charcoal shading overlaid on top of that blue, uh, those two blue patches that were below it. So it extended north and south a little bit and filled in that gap in the middle. So you now have one contiguous single highway cover it also widened the highway cover a little bit to allow for, if we go to the next slide, this revised southbound off-ramp and on-ramp. And so during the summer months, we talked about what does it really mean to have a different method to get off the freeway when you go southbound or you get on on-ramp to go southbound. So you're on and off ramps. Um, and what that meant is you had to widen the highway cover to allow traffic to get underneath it to now get to a new location to get off the freeway and then really maintain that same point to get onto the freeway that exists today. But a pretty significant change compared to what we had before. It also, if you go to the next slide, please, modifies uh, a couple of other items. Number one, it takes that green loop crossing and locates it on top of the highway cover. So basically it shifts it to the north just a little bit onto Widler Street or just to the south of Widler Street. So the project is still providing the overall green loop crossing, that connection that's really important to the city. Uh, it's just locating it in a slightly different place, uh, slightly further to the north on the highway cover itself. And then last, a really important point, if we go to the next slide, it adds back in the Flint Avenue, the Flint Street crossing. So in the original concept, you, if you can again, look at that light blue that's underneath, the Flint crossing was actually severed on the east side of the freeway, and you had to connect over to Vancouver to get across. So instead, the extension of the highway cover maintains Flint Avenue and really maintains all of those street network, that, that complete street network that exists today um, in order to recreate it, and then adds in that additional space for potential uses on top. And so this really is kind of the, the hallmark changes that come with the project that the updated environmental review process will run through and make sure and verify for, for resource and impacts. There are other more, I guess, subtle changes that are associated with this. And it's one of the reasons why there's other potential impacts. And so a full sweep across all of the technical reports to say, okay, how does this change influence the findings is really what this process that we're gonna be looking at over the next year uh, will be about. So if we go to the next slide, this slide highlights, and it's a little bit hard to see, but if you really look at that darker blue highway cover, the potential for buildings. And this is what is so fascinating and, and frankly awesome about this project, is this opportunity to build multi-story buildings on top of the highway covers at certain locations, and the opportunity to assist with a redevelopment potential off the highway covers. So uh, one of the key things about the, the ODOT project is that the buildings themselves aren't necessarily gonna be built by ODOT. Uh, the project is, the, the highway cover is, but what happens next is it supports a redevelopment effort by others to allow whatever is decided to be placed on the highway covers to unfold. And so one of the challenges as an engineer is how do you predict what the future will be, not knowing what the future will be? Well, that's what over the next couple of years working with the city and, and other external agencies will resolve in is um, how should we design this highway cover to support whatever this future build out would be from a, from a building standpoint. So it's exciting to be at this place 
And we have to look into that as part of this environmental update. All right, next slide, please. So from a timeline standpoint, the takeaway is the star at the end, um, having this updated NEPA or environmental decision by the end of this year, late 2022. To get there, we have to go through a series of steps. The first step is updating those technical reports. So really a whole litany of different reports to assess impacts. You then take that information and put it into um, a supplemental environmental assessment, which is really a document that carries the various impacts and analysis into it. It will go out for public review in the middle of summer, and then ultimately be updated to again land at the end of this year with this NEPA decision document by the end of the year. So really, when the question was asked about timeline, how long will it take, will be there will be additional delays, um, this process gets us to uh, a conclusion of the updated environmental impacts by the end of this year so that construction can happen and start by the end of 2023. All right, one more slide and then we'll pause for to see if there's any other questions. Um, so about those technical reports. So what are those things? It's really a different technical study that takes the information that was developed for the original project and then updates it based on the changes that I showed a few slides ago. And so we'll look at traffic and safety and active transportation which really bikes and pedestrians and ADA, transit, historic impacts, land use, right away noise, on and on. Um, to make sure that we've assessed through the change of the project, how those these different resources are affected by this change, going from that two cover concept to a single cover concept that could potentially have buildings on top. And so that's what this is all about. Uh, over the next year, I'm sure that we'll be in front of you to talk about different points along the way. And, um, I think with the next slide, I will pause to see if there are any questions of which I think there's already one in the chat. Ms. Sharon, did you want to elaborate on your question? I was just asking, just listening to Steve lay this out and it was exciting to see it literally in some form. I know that environmental impact assessments by the feds, um, go differently, often depending on administrations. Um, but I'm trying to understand based on how you laid out what we asked for and the rationale for the hybrid three, what kinds of questions from past experiences do you envision might catch the attention of the feds with this redesign and the purposefulness around it? or what kinds of things might drag out beyond your assumed agreement process and cause this to come off schedule. I'm asking you for future speculation, I realize, or um, a golden <laughs> ball. Sure, Megan, I can take that, or if you wanna take the first stab at it, I'm happy to address if you'd like. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and you can um, help, help clean up anything that I might have missed there. Um, but Sharon, thanks for that. I think, you know, as you said, uh, administration matters uh, when you're doing your projects. And I think we uh, are the stars of a line with where we are right now with hybrid three um, and particularly the administration's um, focus on reconnecting communities. Um, and so I think we have, you know, we've been in close coordination with our federal partners. They are very much in support of the pivot um, and the change that we've made to uh, be responsive to the community um, and really take that step back and acknowledge the harm that ODOT caused when the interstate was originally built and how we can help kind of address um, that by way of not repeating those same harms as we move forward. So I think from a policy and process standpoint, um, we're in really good shape um, by way of what we are moving forward. That said, there's always unforeseen things. Um, so devil's in the details, of course. Um, but I think we have been, you know, in close coordination with the environmental staff at Federal Highway Administration to, um, again, as we're sort of setting up, what are the technical reports that we need to update? Um, here's the proposed methodology. Here's our process for updating it so that um, we limit any of those surprises, that it's really done kind of shoulder to shoulder in partnership um, to keep us moving forward. Um, and make sure that we're following, you know, the right federal regulations um, of this administration too, and making any updates that we have there. So 
Um, I'm feeling pretty confident about the process we have, um, but Steve, I'll let you chime in with any further detail as well. Well, you gave a very thorough and complete answer. I don't have, know if I have much more to say. Um, it's the classic, what keeps you up at night question. And I think the answer is <clears throat> because we're, we're in the midst of the technical reports, um, you know, essentially there are changes, there are differences, especially with transportation patterns. And so we want to understand the impacts of that. But uh, we feel very comfortable that this process is going to lead to uh, a similar you know, outcome of, of finding no significant impacts at the end. Only FHWA can declare that. Um, but that's where we're anticipating this to go. And we want to make sure we do a thorough and accurate look across the board to make sure that there isn't any surprises that comes from um, this, this movement towards a hybrid three cover. So, so that's where we are. Um, I kind of think of this as more of an administrative change um, as opposed to something that's more significant. Uh, but it's important to us for us to walk through and be objective around every single one of those technical reports to see if there is an impact that we weren't anticipating when this conversation first happened. Thank you. Are there other questions for Steve uh, regarding what you just heard? If you think of them at a later date, please feel free to send me an email or shoot me a text. I'll make sure to pass those on and we'll do our best to uh, answer all of your questions. Uh, with that, Steve, I'll turn it over to you to move ahead. Sure. Or if you think of it during my next portion, go ahead and ask me at the end of this. Um, so we're going to walk through now. Let's let's assume we're in the future. All of those, you know, what keeps you up at night fears have gone behind us and we're now moving into construction. So what does that really mean for this kind of a project? So we want to talk about the construction work packages. This isn't a totally new concept, but at least we want to outline it and show it in a way that has both timing updated and content updated a little bit. So if we go to the next slide, and by the way, I love this new, these new graphic formats. I love the colors. This is, this is fun to present this. Um, so our construction work package overview, and we've talked about work packages A, B, C, main before. So here we are talking about it one more time. Um, so in light of schedule, and now we have the uh, hybrid three concept environments review that's happening and has started again in the late part of 2021 and extends through 2022. And then these four different work packages. So work package A, and I'm referring to the top graphic now, Work package A in purple is on the far left side, which is the north side of I-5. Um, this one is really the first one out of the gate. Uh, and it's gonna be uh, a, a modest construction project on the north end, but, but it creates improvements associated with I-5 and the I-405 interchange, and maybe a little bit of the on-ramps uh, and off-ramps to it. Uh, package B on the far southern end, on the far right side of the page, is going to be the second package that goes to construction, not too many months later, and frankly, maybe one or two months later, both of them in 2023. And it, it really creates some improvements around the interchange between I-5 and I-84. Safety improvements, so you're getting some early safety benefits out of the project through these first sets of construction projects. Then you incrementally work towards the middle, which is shown in orange, early work package C. This is a brand new conceived package. And what it did is it took a piece of package B and embedded it in at the Rose Quarter Transit Center. It took some elements that originally were slated for the main construction package and said, let's get that done earlier. And this is the retaining wall around the Harriet Tubman Middle School and a bridge that's on I-5 right next to that point. And then some work in the middle of the project. You can see those spot points in orange where we're talking about building demolition. So again, trying to advance project work um, that is needed to advance to help do ultimately the main construction package, which has construction slated for 2025. And this is really the, the heart and soul of the project with the highway cover being the, the focal point of it. But there's a whole slew of city street infrastructure improvements that are coupled with that, that highway cover. So that is the overview. We're gonna. Let's progress forward if we could for the next slide. Talk with one side each, so just a little tidbit into each one of these work packages. So next slide, please. So package A, again, this is the far north end of the project in purple. 
Um, it, it's hallmarked by, again, the interchange I-405, I-5 improvements, some off-ramp improvements to Greeley Avenue, some retaining walls, some stormwater facilities, all of this to help uh, get the project initiated, launched uh, in 2023. What's really important about all of these early work packages is that it creates the ability to have disadvantaged business enterprises, DBEs, start on the project earlier. And the, all, the, the set or the suite of early work packages, A, B, and C, leads to uh, some early estimates of about 30 to $40 million in DBE construction work. I will say that these are early projections based on some earlier designs. We're now at a 60% submittal for early work package A and the contracting team is looking to update those numbers um, based on that information. And so this is a bit dated, this 30 to $40 million range for the early work packages. And so more information can come in the future as more design information. We can move forward one or two slides. Yep, then we can jump to the next. I'm I'm seeing my internet connection might be unstable. Are you guys still hearing me okay? Yep, okay, thank you. All right, work package B is on the far southern end of the project. Um, so this is where the, the improvements, the I-5, I-84 interchange is happening. Really, it's safety improvements. If you, if you drive out there today, be real careful as you're getting off the freeway onto these ramps to the Morrison Bridge or something else. It's a fairly sharp angle. And one of the things the project is doing is creating more space in the event that people want to, again, stay on I-5 or veer. So it's creating some safety benefits um, that are happening in that, that interchange zone. It also builds more retaining walls and barrier rails and seismic retrofits in and around the project area. So really it's, it's capturing all of the project needs on the very Southern end of the project itself. But that same message about, again, the sum of all the work packages um, are in that 30 to $40 million range. This particular package is nearing the 60% point. So we're sort of chunking right along in terms of design progression. And every time we have a major percentage milestone, we hand it over to the contractor to price the elements out and then ultimately to update how they best see fit using the DBE community and the rest of their forces to construct the work. All right, if we move to the next package, early work package C, this is that incremental movement towards the middle, um, where again, uh, we're anticipating work to start as early as the first quarter of 2024. So again, right after those first two work packages. And it's again about creating some improvements on the freeway, creating a northbound um, auxiliary lane that extends uh, from Broadway and ultimately starts to free up some space for the contractor to start working in the area that's ultimately the main package. And so if we move to the last slide, uh, the main construction package itself, it's really, again, hallmarked by the highway cover, the local street improvements, and all of the work that's gonna be facilitated to, to land on, what is this covering gonna be, and how might the, the whole system be reconnected again when it's all said and done. Um, because of the scale of this particular package, the DBE numbers, both in dollars and percentage, tend to go up. So in this you know, roughly 90 to $120 million range. And again, this is based on some early estimates. And as more information is known, these, these numbers for DBEs will be changed uh, in the future as well. So with that, I think that's all the slides I have. Um, I'll pause here and then get off the stage and let you know, James and the team talk about other fun stuff. Sounds good. Mr. James McGrath. Uh, happy to go, but uh, questions for, for Steve on the, on the packaging. It is directly related to what we'll talk about next, but, but if there are questions, let's, let's hear those first. Indeed. Any questions from the HAB? Hearing, seeing none, 
Always know that if they come to you, you can uh, raise your hand and we'll acknowledge. So James, to you. All right. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, my uh, colleagues, Bill and Marianne, whom you've met before. We're going to partner to step through a, uh, a bunch of important work that needs to happen and flows from the schedule and the packaging that Steve just explained. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to use the Miro board again. And this is intended to be a dialogue. Um, and, and so please feel free to interject. Can everybody see my screen? It's zoomed way out and I promise to zoom it in and make this legible and useful uh, in just a moment. So um, as Steve said, early work package A is first out of the gate. It is up, uh, generally speaking, north of Harriet Tubman Middle School and the Russell Street overcrossing. We have two key topics we wanna to talk about uh, with you tonight. One is the bridge that goes over Russell, the new bridge. And the other is the wall that is adjacent to uh, Harriet Tubman. It has two faces, both the highway face and the community face. We're gonna talk about specific ideas that we wanna put forward to you. And we are hoping for specific choices and feedback from you. If we have time, we'll move to early work package B and get a little bit ahead of some of the, the topics that will become more and more pressing as that, uh, as that part of the project heads towards a 60% design milestone and then a 90% mile design milestone right after that. Um, if we have time after that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about overarching thoughts about how the urban design elements, the betterments and community partnerships can continue uh, with some focus. So three big uh, ideas uh, to discuss today. And we'll start uh, first at the North End in uh, Early Work Package A. It's my screen updating for you. Okay. So the first is there is a new bridge that is built over the Russell Street on the Eastern face of that. And I'm gonna zoom into a plan that describes so here we are on Russell Street and there's, a, there's a, a, a very thin bridge, but a new bridge that goes over Russell Street. And you can see, you would see that bridge as you were traveling from east to west, down the hill into Russell, uh, you will see that bridge. And that bridge is, here's a plan drawing of it, is relatively thin in comparison to the width of the highway now but it will be conspicuous. It will be new infrastructure and therefore we get to design it um, uh, the way we like. So that's what we're gonna dive into. That's a little bit of wayfinding, but I'm gonna hand it to Bill to talk about the, the big ideas that we have, which are casting things into place on that actual bridge, attaching things later to the bridge, uh, patterns, steel cutouts, uh, words, um, and then there is an idea about how we might be able to improve the existing bridge on the west side, looking east as you travel up the hill. So with that, I'll turn it to Bill. And Bill, guide me and uh, let's, let's do this together. Yeah, there you go. Great. Um, thanks, James. Um, as James just mentioned, we have, you know, these three, three um, types of uh, treatments that we are looking at for this, this location. Um, I think one of the things the urban design team recognized overall is that these are the three, I mean, these overpasses here, Rose Quarter and further down the other intersections are real key opportunities where you're going to have the most pedestrian traffic of anybody that's going to come into contact with this project for some time until at least the covers are at least done. So what we're trying to do is really... Um, create an experience here that in terms of what HAB may be looking for and objectives, some way to help brand and identify this area as an Albina district area. And so we've looked at these, these treatments as James have talked about. Um, we've got the guardrail where his um, uh, cursor is now, which basically sits up on top. I believe that's about 16 feet or so above, above grade. That's but right. That, that, that barrier is something that's gonna be linear at about four and a half feet of, of height. And so what we've looked at is trying to come up with um, a patterns of what, what patterns can we use that might be a good branding and a good uh, image and wall treatment to use along this, along this path. Um, again, this is just some examples of uh, geometric forms, um, maybe heritage patterns of some type that we've been looking at. 
Um, zoom out a little bit more, yeah. Um, but these are things that could be easily cast into um, and, and decorate those barriers along, along the wall um, up above along the freeway. James, you want to go a little bit more to the right and look at those other patterns? Yeah, I'll just say that that it's this is one pattern that we've found yeah. that that seems to resonate with some of the shape families and language of uh, the the mud cloth patterns and the other uh, patterns that Bill has highlighted. But it's it doesn't have to be that. That's what we want to get into with you as one of these ideas. And there are others. A lot of these are uh, we're looking for things that are available in the market uh, before we jump to a custom. Uh, form liner. Right. Great. One of, um, I think the other, we could probably go down to the attached panels. Yeah. Let's move through all three ideas and then we can Got have it. a discussion about this. Okay. Uh, so here we looked at the bridge. And again, this is from the, the West side. These are the, the, the um, you're going to see four different schemes that represent a lot of different ideas. Um, but here again, the concrete crash barrier we're looking at in this particular case, it only goes down, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hang below the, the deck, but here's an opportunity to do some sort of lighted sign, or as the image was to the left, kind of a, a lattice of some type that could be put um, and highlighted um, up on that screen. So it could be lit at night, have some presence during the day, could be lit at night. So it's got some, some, dramatic, some dramatic features to it. Um, off to the right. Oh, sorry, Bill. That's all right. Off to the right, we looked at an opportunity where where maybe that maybe that um, that wall treatment and that what we were going to do took on a longer and, and, a, and a, a little bit wider, deeper. Um, we could because we have the opportunity to go below the deck. So this might be an opportunity, much as we've kind of shown here. Maybe some sort of image, uh, some sort of graphic, some sort of. Um, in other words, there's a variety of images and there's a great location if you want to put something right there because there's going to be a lot of visibility to people coming into that area. So it's a good way to, a good signature point. Off to the left, um, these are four different kind of schemes we kind of developed, which look at various different types of signage. Uh, let's go to the, yeah, let's go to the top one. Um, so what we did in, and what you're gonna see in these next four options are a variety of different things that I'm just kind of throwing out there to give you uh, opportunities to uh, react to or think about how we would treat, for example, a column. Um, you'll see the columns off to the left. Um, we've got the round dots are, re are really representing some sort of treatment. It could be a... a uh, a plaster medallion, it could be some sort of uh, sculpture. Down below that, we're looking at maybe having maybe some ceramic tile, something that's surface mounted. Um, and then below that, in the in the lighter color blue, blue is the aqua is the um, is a base. But in between that could be a portrait or a, or a or a mural of some type in that light color. So these these uh, columns could be could have certain parts that are much more permanent. But there could be sections where you've got a mural that gets changed on a on some sort of periodic basis. Um, and here again, up above, I looked at a sign, the the albina sign. Um, again, I'm just trying to give you several different notions as you go down from this to the other three below. Um, just an, an opportunity for to have albina written in some way or identified in some way. Um, James, you want to show that screen up onto the right? Yeah, um, you could have some sort of lattice work like that that was lit up and then uh, backlighted. Uh, and then more in the middle of that span, you could have the albina um, uh, sign done in many different ways. Um, the first one, uh, sec okay, the second one, um, again, we're looking at um, another type of a sign. If you zoom in on the second one. This one here, peach tree. Yeah, and then a little bit more to the left. Yep, show the image, yeah. Um, it could be a very simple thing where you've just got, you know, the, um, the bridge deck itself is just painted and then you accentuate that by just having a, a, a light like the peach tree sign um, as, a, as a treatment for the albina. Um, again, 
the ceramic tiles along the columns. You still could always paint those murals and then some sort of surface medallions at the fence up on top. So in other words, what we're trying to do is maybe identify this as a portal um, as you're coming into Albina, that this would have some of the treatments that might begin to set the branding treatments for other parts of this particular project. Um, going down to the next one, James, the third one. Perfect, right there. Um, again, um, if you look at the, some of the images on the right about what we are proposing or suggesting for some of the signage, the upper one on the right, just sort of a backlit, backlit sign that kind of outlines Albina. And then maybe you might have some uh, treatment patterns on either side that just sort of accentuate the, the heritage and the culture of the Albina community. Um, and then finally, the fourth one, I think, you know, just, just more um, treatments of the sign, some different ideas of the tile, um, and then a different uh, signage, stencil signage off to the right, where maybe this is, a, a, if you get a little closer to that image on the right, yeah, um, something along the ideas of um, large letters that are broadcast, you know, across the entire opening. So if you zoom back, what we're trying to do is just give you some options um, of what's, um, what's most attractive to you. Are there things there that you really like or recommend? Um, we're looking for some direction about which way to go and to come back with more uh, information later down the road. But um, uh, any thoughts about what you've seen? Preferences, more information. I think ultimately, you know, there's, there's two schools of thought at this bridge. Could be something that's pressed in and permanent. It could be something that comes later. You can see we're really attracted to the 24 hour, the ability to incorporate light. We do think and are working towards incorporating light, art, architectural light more broadly underneath the structure. But we're talking just today about what 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 is the gateway? What does it feel like? What does it say? And how can it contribute? So open for open for thoughts. Bryson, I see your hand. Yeah, so a um, couple of things. First, uh, you know, you've got that. It looked like on the uh, several of those different ideas you had uh, space for a surface medallion. And, you know, we've now got a got a new cool logo. And I'm wondering if mm. that could be turned into the, the medallion in, in those sorts of things, because I think that would be kind of a, uh, a cool, a little bit more localized uh, um, thing. I mean, we probably would would probably want to take off the text and just use the onion dome. But um, that could be something that that could be the could be that feature yeah there's all I, i've worked with a manufacturer in town who makes those medallions out of uh plaster and, and cement and they can get incredible detail in there so i think you know from the design other than the text they could probably have all the detail that are shown in that drawing in the dome so that that, that was an idea i was really thinking of would be really a great location for it Pranavasa, I see your hand. Yes, um, my first question is about um, the image in the attached panels, that image on the, um, yes, that one. Um, I'm wondering if that can be a changing panel, like does the images have to be stagnant or is it like a screen where it's it's um, projecting something, like could it be a movie or fit, like can it, can it be other things or is it just um, just single images? Well, for this particular location where it is over a roadway and in front of a roadway, the highway behind, I don't think projection is going to be feasible. I think it would be static. Um, projection, we'll talk about it later. We actually have proposals for how projection could enliven maybe some spaces, some urban canvases underneath the highways. Uh, but I don't think we would succeed in trying to get a moving image uh, over the roadway space. And just to clarify, I think I used the wrong word. I don't think I mean projection. I mean like a um, video footage. 
or is it the same thing? I think it's the same thing. Yeah, you would have okay. to cast that onto uh, the surface. Um, the idea that some of this might be rotating is, is something that has come up with uh, the, the HAB as, as mentioned before. And I think we have a couple of ideas where that specific kind of rotating thing could make sense. But you have to imagine this will be mounted up above a roadway on a bridge. It will be somewhat permanent. Okay. And then my other question is about the albina sign, which I really like. It's really cool to see that. Um, I'm wondering if those, how are those pow uh, powered? Can they be solar powered or what, what is the power source for all of these different lighting things? That's what we're about to embark on. If, if you tell us you really prefer these signage solutions, backlit solutions, we will start working with the electrical engineering team to find the power source. I suspect it will be an, a, an actual power source that is hardwired, but the agency ODOT may have agreements about uh, purchasing power from sustainable sources. So I don't know we could make that we can make the direct connection between a solar panel and that specific light fixture. Um, but I, I suspect ODOT has solar partnerships already uh, in place around the state. Well, I think that's um, that would be my recommendation is to just explore the um, different aspects of providing lighting that's from a sustainable source and followed up with that. I think um, a design that weathers the stand of time, like what, whichever of these is going to look the best over a long period of time and think about, you know, if the bulb goes out or something, is it going to look like it says, you know, Albin or something instead of Albina <laughs> in 50 years. Like, I just don't want anything that's going to look janky yep. or raggedy in time. And so um, those are the two things that came up for me. Thank you. I would respond that as, as we've been kind of looking at these as a team, we've been, we've been, you know, very focused on things, low energy, very sustainable and, and locally made and, and the kind of things that are going to wear well. I guess I, uh, let me ask you of these, is there a certain type of the, sign, of the signs that we've shown? Is there one that is more uh, attractive that you're thinking about? Maybe it's just the, the sunset in the background behind the peach tree corner one, but um, I happen to be fond of light that looks like it's natural lighting and something that doesn't look like it, you know, something that just feels warm and inviting and that mimics the, the natural sun, at least it's pleasant for me. Okay. When you, when you talk about that, are you thinking of that um, not lighted, not, not lit, but just naturally lit? No, I think lit. I just think a, okay. a, a power source that doesn't look too LED and, and you know, um, sterile, if you understand what I mean. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Are there other uh, yeah, this is Keith Edwards. Yes, Keith. Yeah, I've been okay. on the phone, so I, I'm not able to see anything, but I just had, I wanted to have to think about, um, uh, the seven principles of Kwanzaa and having them up year round instead of having them only one week during the year. Um, that, that speaks to who we are and it speaks to what we should be about. And I would like for, you know, to consider that and having those seven principles located throughout that area so that we have something to, um, to remind us about what we should be about on a continuous basis, not just one week or seven days out of the year, but 365 days out of the year. Great, thank you, Keith. Hey, Sharon, I'd love to, um, your question in the chat around collaborative efforts with um, other projects that are designing things in the corridor. Wasn't sure if you wanted to elaborate on your question. Well, other than the fact that I was really thinking about you know, the effort to elevate and amplify what Albina is, what it was, and what it will be in the future, that there, as we start talking about the gateways, the entry and the exit, and some of what Sprenavasa was saying, is that we look at these others so that we don't have, not competing, but very different design selections, that there's complementary, that we're conscious and consistent, and that I did name Albina Vision Trust because of the movement that they are engaged in 
and the naming and the design and the claiming the community, both in the um, purposeful design, but also in the ways that people understand you're in Albina or you're entering Albina, how that could be thought about in a way that there is complementary thinking that doesn't take away from the individuality. And so that there is something about it that's well aligned, that's purposeful, and that's complementary. That would be important to me, no matter what bridge I crossed or how I entered, that I see some things that are consistent and that actually elevate in the ways that I think we all want. So um, AVT comes to mind and there are others, but I'm just thinking of where they are in their process and what is next. And they spend a lot of time around community input and design and, and, and what that means. Thinking of what Keith said also, how do you implement you know, collective work and responsibility? Right. How do you ensure faith and unity and those things are reflected um, and consistently. So thanks. I'm excited about all this. I love design and I'm not the person I watch far too many shows. I love, <laughs> I love everything from flipping to rehabbing. So I would be lost trying to pick the panels and the attachments and the casting. You could send me there and wouldn't have to worry about me anymore. You know, Ms. Sharon, thank you so much for bringing that up. I wonder as we are working through the intergovernmental agreements and potentially um, partners coming back, if there would somehow be an opportunity for Albina Vision Trust to even present uh, there. I know there are some things that are public in regards to the design, because I, I would say uh, it is our encouragement that this, this project be collaborative. Uh, with what other uh, community groups are doing. I think that's powerful that there be a, a consistency and collaboration um, that, that to me would speak to um, us coming together to be able to see and say, yes, uh, we wanna be in concert uh, with those groups. Great, great choice of words. I think you, you hit exactly the way we've been kind of looking at this approach and our, our approach in terms of dealing with this entire um, for four intersections that we've been kind of looking at. Um, James, you want to go down to the, just below and, and just talk briefly on the west side? I think before we move, I think Bison also had some oh, gotcha. input here. Yeah, sorry. I, just, I wanted to follow up on what Spurnavasa said, because I think, A, I, I definitely support kind of her vision as far as the sign goes. I think that's a great idea. I also thinking about in, with the casting, you know, if we've got kind of these other features that are going in different places uh, to have, to maybe think about the casting after we kind of figure out where we're going with the, with the, uh, with the various other features. So mm -hmm. then we can just kind of get a casting that sort of matches whatever, whatever we, we put in, uh, in with the, the, kind of more main, more colored uh, features uh, on the on that section of the bridge. And then the other thing I'm thinking is it would be nice to, to have, you know, maybe we have a similar theme or a similar kind of overall style, but to have each different bridge and location look a little bit more, a little bit distinctive so that, you know, as people are trying to figure out, coming through, figure out where they are, you know, they know, oh, this is the X bridge. Oh, this is the Y bridge. And you can kind of identify and, and orient yourself based on the, on the decoration as well. Okay. So some, some degree of consistency, but also some degree of distinction that separates each place and identifies it as its own location. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, kind of like the, a, a, broad, a similar enough theme to know that you're still in the same area, but you know one location separate from another location and you can kind of you can kind of use those features to describe to somebody where you are or where they need to go gotcha okay really like that and i think um, bryson you're you're headed towards a conversation that we've been having about how do we bring some element to continuity maybe it is that the outside face of that crash barrier has got a consistent pattern but it's the columns that let you know no i'm in this place or that place it's the signage 
Um, and that's, that is where we're trying to, we're trying to get to those things and we can bring back proposals for this would be contiguous. Anytime you engage as a human being in the project, you recognize this sort of pattern band. And then you'd know you were at Russell because it was this particular medallion or this particular column treatment. Right. Awesome. I see a hand from a Miss Estelle. Yeah, I really like um, what Bryson was saying. And something that I kind of thought would be interesting for us to do um, is, is like as we go along each spot, um, talk about the, maybe the history of Albina. Like if we go by the railroad yards, have something about the Black uh, Albina Railroad history, because there's a deep history of a Black community and the railroad here in, in Portland, Oregon. So I thought that might be something to kind of add on, just some kind of historical reference point to as a way to incorporate the community history. I don't know how we would do that, but I kind of thought that would be something. That's a great um, comment. We've been, you know, in our in our work, we've been kind of looking at Portland's historic past and trying to identify, again, pillars of the community and also leaders and also experiences here, much as the, the Van Port um, experience. Uh, so again, that's great. That's great information for us to have that that's something that's of interest because we can kind of continue to figure out how we can kind of work that into the design as we proceed forward. Absolutely. And I think um, we have been thinking a project like this is experienced and exists at multiple scales. There is the, there's a whole big project a couple miles long where what Bryson was saying is, what, what can we bring that's contiguous and makes us know that it's one place, elements of continuity? And then there are the, the places sort of at the medium scale, like when you know you're around the Russell area, right? And how can I know that it's specifically Russell? And then there's the thing that's right down at the human scale where you can actually read and learn about the history of this place. And that is the piece that we haven't gotten to yet, but we see that as an overlay and specific insertions and specific stories um, that are legible by, by a person walking by, right? really sort of trying to experience that project at a, at a very, very precise and local level. Um, and I do know that the Albina Vision Trust had, had developed ideas about a historical narrative and a historical walk, and we would want more information to weave that in and make room for those, uh, those moments almost as a pedestrian walking around the project area. So um, I think there are ways for us to do it all. And, and this is really good feedback. Elements of continuity on the big infrastructure elements. Elements of distinction when we get to, we'll say districts or specific places. And then I think we also have a sequence of ideas that we, do, we haven't explored them in detail yet about how to relate to the individual when the individual is walking by and experiencing that project. Okay. Um, Bill um, uh, was wanting to move us along, and I think he's right. Um, on the west side of the Russell Street, the infrastructure project isn't touching the existing bridge. However, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say maybe there's, you know, this gateway's got two sides. I think we would have to do something lightweight and superficial, nothing that we can attach, nothing that we can stamp in but this west side of the bridge is a candidate for us to paint something or you know, do something lightweight, but yet memorable. Um, and, and these are some examples of, this happens to be undersides. This would really, you could think of this either as simple painting and words that the project team could develop, or it could be a commissioned mural piece, mural. Um, depending on your advice. Are there thoughts from the group? It's not pressing and we can return to it. It is definitely something because it's not integrated into the infrastructure, it's something that can come later. And maybe um, we can we could put a pin in it and say, as we start to develop a program of where we might have murals or where we might have, this would be a candidate site for that kind of uh, intervention. Okay. Great. All right, Bill, you kind of talked about this before, but I think it's worth revisiting. 
there is the there's the stuff that's happening on the bridge but there's also those columns and we've talked right. about the medallions we've talked about uh tile treatments um we have thought about what those medallions could be i love the idea of the onion dome you want to lead us through this bill sure um go up a little bit more uh next slide up higher up and just folks where we're let them know kind of where we're talking yep there is a column that will touch down on the on the south side of the Russell Street sidewalk, so very close to people, you'd be able to see that one. And then there's one that's a little bit uh, kind of around the corner, but also very, very visible because, uh, again, this bridge is kind of close to people walking. Um, so these are the two primary columns. There's a forest of columns that exist under there today that, again, would need to be a more superficial treatment like painting. But for the two columns that we'll build, new, we thought we could do something either cast in, uh, in concrete or attached. So a similar family of choices. Right. It's great. Uh, as you continue down, as James was just kind of talking about here, you're much, you're much, again, people are walking and you're much closer. I think on the low end, I think the, the, the bottom of the bend is somewhere around or bottom of the deck is somewhere around 12 feet or 14 feet. Um, so it's an opportunity for somebody who's walking up to these, um, a pedestrian is really going to have a chance to, to notice the detail in whatever artwork we kind of put up there. So we pulled in some cast in place sort of images that um, we're, we're kind of showing you here. Um, again, those could be consistent. They could also, yeah. um, maybe, maybe it is this uh, added later medallion thing, the onion dome or another pattern that you attach later, but also could have that backlit thing, which, which we think is pretty attractive. Right. So another opportunity to, to either do straight a, a medallion, as, a, as Bryson mentioned, or a backlit item here that could be a variety of different shapes. There's always the opportunity to do painted things, but we've heard from you before that paint is somewhat superficial. I think if we're interested in painting or treating existing infrastructure, paint is likely to be the primary way that we can touch the existing structure. So there is gonna be a cleaving of the, what's new can be concrete, steel. What exists is likely, we're, we're putting wrapping around it uh, in order to contribute to uh, making a, a more- a place. Uh, yeah, a nicer place. Um, there's a hybrid sort of idea around tile, Bill. I, you've, this is some uh, interesting work that you've discovered. Yeah, um, the ones on the left are up off of uh, interstate. But just the example of, of trying to uh, use a different material, a more durable, a durable material. Also a situation where you could get youth involved in doing this um, or a commissioned artist to kind of put this kind of work together. So we've heard a preference in this in, as we make columns and caps. We've heard a preference for maybe an element of consistency around that medallion. Would, would the HAB be generally supportive of the onion dome as the, as the maybe the signature element, the, an element of continuity? I see some head nods, but... Um, and is that something that you feel would be cast in permanently or attached? I personally, I, I, I would not, but I don't know what I would prefer instead. I do like the concept of the tiling. Um, and I think that the uh, wall that you're going to have to build uh, west of where Tubman sits right now should have a tribute to Tubman, whether it's a student or alumni led uh, mural design. I don't think the school will stay at the current location, but because the wall has to be there, um, you know, it, it, it should have some continuity about uh, what it's holding up. Okay. Great. I see Mr. Edwards and Bryson have their hand raised. Uh, thank you. you. You said the onion, I'm, and I apologize, I, I just got on uh, the the actual video on it. I haven't seen anything before. So what is the onion? Oh, I meant to say the onion dome, which uh, is the, it's the, um, from the, I think it was called the Russell block or the hilltop site that that historic building had a really signature. It is the dome that's now in the park uh, as part of the gazebo. 
Um, is that an appropriate signal or symbol to repeat throughout the project in, in, a, in a discrete sort of form on columns, on, um, uh, on, on the sort of structure itself? Yeah, sort of a little bit of a takeoff off a new logo that's just been developed. That's right. And and I would like us to pull up uh, a visual of yeah. the um, Russell Street. Just one moment. Okay. I will stop sharing to allow that. I don't know if I can pull it up faster than you. Uh, Bryson, maybe while we're hunting for that uh, to share with Keith, do you want to share your, your thoughts? Yeah, your question, your comments. Mute. You're on mute. Regardless of what we, we put on the medallion, uh, I, I think I like the idea of having it have color. And so it, I would, would imagine that'd probably be easier if it was something that was attached. And, you know, I'd, I'd probably give up a little bit of permanence to get a little bit more color in that area. But kind of in the other direction, you know, I know, I know uh, John has mentioned before his preference for things that were a bit more permanent than, than, uh, than just paint. So I do like the idea of having things like, like tile in certain areas, uh, like the columns and such, uh, to provide a little bit more durability to, to whatever whatever we do. Okay. Just for reference, before I move to Mr. Washington, this is the historic Russell Street hilltop, um, and we're talking about this dome here at the top as a symbol. Uh, and their question is, would that be significant uh, and acceptable as a repeatable? Uh, um, distinguishing albina uh, factor. I think it's important that it was mentioned before um, that, you know, we want to um, collaborate with other uh, groups that are interested in what's going on here as well. And so I think it's important to, you know, get our opinion, of course, but also get the opinion of others in, as well. Our opinion is no important than other folks. Okay. Indeed. Mr. Washington, I see your hand. Yes. Good evening, Eric, and thank you. You know, we in the Soul District have a, a large background on putting, instilling art in the district. And one of the things that I, I'm consistently struggling with is damage to the pieces. You know, um, this whole notion of tagging and, and all of these types of things. So and then earlier in the conversation, we talked a little bit also about who would be responsible because when we start talking about art, it becomes a little bit of a different dynamic other than the parts that you guys are talking about stamping and the consistency of stamping on concrete versus placing art on it. You know, I've had a lot of experience across the country in different places and looking at highways and putting stamps in like places like New Mexico, having the gecko on the side of the wall and these types of things that you can't damage too well. I mean, you know, uh, an art, uh, one of those taggers can come in and tag over that stuff, but you can still see the stamp and the stencil and all that kind of stuff. But when you start putting art pieces up that is a lot of busyness inside of that, and then you get a tagger that comes in, you'll be amazed at how quickly that scenario that's pleasant goes to looking very unpleasant, you know, because of the different kinds of colors and stuff like that. And it doesn't take a tag or much to come in. And before you know it, it starts looking like the hood. And so, um, you know, just costing you about how many colors you use, what's the art types that you use. If you're going to use things that you can quickly clean up, if you have to clean it up, if taggers do come in and tag on it, you know, the types of materials that you use, those types of things are going to be kind of important. But I think the simplicity of a piece also says a lot also, so it doesn't have to be too busy. And then, of course, the rotating screen stuff. I think that you can get away with a lot of that new technology on that. But again, it boils back to who's going to take care of the, if you got a building that we got to be worried about in the 99-year lease, and we know who's going to be taking care of the bridge plate because ODOT's going to be on in the property, so when we look at the art, who's going to be owning the art and who's going to be maintenancing the art if we're going to do art? 
And if not, then, you know, then who's going to be making sure that these pieces have a 99 year quality that as we go through our time, that it maintains a consistency, uh, you know, of quality and that when people come visit our city and they visit Albina, that they're going to be impressed more so than just saying, well, there's some stuff that just been messed up, you know? So anyway, that's just some of my thoughts on that. Very appreciated. Good thoughts. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, I, uh, oh, I was going to say, John, I think the other thing is that I think we're, we're very aware that all we're trying to do is set up placeholders for a certain type of treatment mm -hmm. work can be done later. And with, with comments like you, you just reflected and also with input from artists about those issues you're talking about durability and maintenance and all that sort of stuff. So really appreciate your, your, your words. So are you going to, in partnerships, are you going to do uh, those people who take care of the art uh, work. What's the name of that organization downtown there that uh, that um, protects and pays to have oh, uh, artists do the art? What, what's Rack, the name of Regional Rack, arts. And yeah, regional and arts. Are they going to be drawn into this conversation at some point in time? Or, you know, or th is the city going to be drawn into the conversation about taking care of the artwork or that kind of stuff? So are you guys going to partner with people? What about that kind of partnership? We are working to go. Do you want to go ahead, Megan? Yeah, I said I can jump in here. And, and John, you know, you were asking the right questions here. And those are all the things um, that we need to work out the details of. But yes, we welcome we welcome that partnership with the city. Yes, we welcome partnerships with organizations that take this on. Um, and also, you know, looking to your guidance on who who are the, you know, the right parties or, um, or entities um, to be partnering with as well. We know that that's a key next step. I think, you know, by way of ODOT and the project, we're committed um, to carrying um, art and, and culture forward as part of this project. Uh, but there's a lot of those details to still um, make sure that we're, we're defining as we do that. Thank you. And if we have time, um, I, there is some information we want to talk about how many different opportunities for art we're tracking. Um, I think there is an ambition to push as much of these ideas into the project and then have some selected places where we'd have a commissioned artist um, that, that's really focused and in those high touch areas. But we hopefully uh, will make enough progress tonight that we can get to that conversation. So with that, I, I would like to move us along because we have another really important topic, which is the wall. Um, some, some have uh, alluded to the importance of that wall and, and the extent of the wall. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen can you see that now? Yep. Okay. So um, we talked about Russell and the bridge and we got some great feedback. I was taking notes to the uh, best degree possible. And I feel like we've got some actionable things that we can develop and come back to you with. Um, the other big thing in early work package A, um, and it actually spans package A and C, uh, but some of that nuance is less important than the fact that there is a very large wall um, in the north part of the project that extends essentially from the highway cover uh, to the north, past the school and kind of down the slope, very close to Russell. It's a big long wall. It's kind of complicated in its construction. We're gonna talk about that wall. Um, that wall faces the highway and that wall also, a segment of that wall also faces the school. And so we'll talk about it in the community face and we'll talk about it in the highway face. We'll take the highway face first. Um, we, we can answer a ton of questions about how the wall is made and its construction, but that might bore you. Um, we have the same kind of uh, choice of ideas about how we make the wall. Um, and here again, Bill will talk about the highway face, Marianne will talk about the community face, the school face. But there are some ideas that we take the wall and we, we create a pattern of vertical pieces. There is an idea that says this wall is pretty long. Maybe as an ethic on the project or a design idea, we're trying to lower its height. We're trying to break up the verticality by accentuating some horizontal lines. And we could, we could explore that. The other is let's keep most of the walls simple, but have these featured areas where we do something special. Now, again, this is the highway face. So special means probably cast in place concrete, but with a particular pattern. Um, we don't believe there's uh, a, a tremendous amount of treasure should be expended in trying to appeal to driving cars, but there should be something that signifies, as you've told us before, when someone is traversing this project area, to know that they're passing through Albina. 
um, not just any place in Oregon and not just any place in America, but there has to be something distinctive. So we have a couple of ideas that we wanna share about the how do we make the wall? How do we design the wall? And I'll zoom in and, and Bill will take it away. Yeah. You, um, right, you, I think we've, we, you've seen our, uh, this approach we've kind of used with you before, where as we look at this wall, we're trying to set up a series of sequences of how much of this wall needs to be adjusted and treated. Um, and so what you'll see here are, are several different schemes where we try to basically begin to look at a sequencing of various number of, of vertical panels. Um, Dave, if you'd maybe start at the top one, Right. I think this particular case, uh, the thoughts were maybe we have two different types of panels. We treat the entire panels from end to end. It's a, I think it's about 300 feet. And, um, as you can see here, the, the, in this particular case, type A is just one certain textured panel and then in the red and then type B is another a blue is in blue is another textured panel. So the idea is maybe, you know, this section of the wall gets treated especially on either ends of this, it's a, it's a, it's a flat wall. But when you get to this area, um, we we're looking at some sort of treatment. In this particular case, we're calling out in maybe two different types of tile. Um, if you drop down, you start to see a different set of sequences of maybe, you know, maybe four panels of red, maybe a, 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 a typical uh, panels, which are just in the white, and then maybe a special panel in the, in the blue. Um, again, uh, just as we continue down, just sort of changing some different um, uh, modules about how these things might all be set up. And it's also just a different way of, you know, how do we allocate our resources for art? Where should they all be? And in, in, um, just in a few spaces and leave some stuff open, or do you try to, you know, do a lot in this one particular, one particular spot? And here again, we're, we're exploring some patterns that are uh, more commonly available um, in the hopes that maybe there's, maybe there's some, some visual preferences uh, amongst the team. But maybe before we jump to the other idea, Mr. Washington has hand up. Yeah. Just one basic question, and that is, is this wall going to be in the tunnel or is it going to be outside the tunnel? Outside the tunnel. This is north of the tunnel. Okay. And so when you come out of the tunnel, you'll be seeing this? On your right-hand side. On your right. Right. You're right. I know where the wall is now. Okay. So none of it will be tucked underneath the tunnel. So when you come through the tunnel, it's clear it's going to be that wall. Then that wall runs. What, how, how long did you say it was going to be again? I think about 300 feet. Yeah. 300 feet. It's a lot and, of wall. Yeah. A and, lot the, of and, wall. and as you come out of the wall from the very first time heading north, that wall is about 36 feet high. Yeah, that's a lot of wall. It's a big canvas. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah, I would agree with the, the stencils to a certain yeah. degree, you know, at least parts of it. Right. But you, okay. don't, you don't have to maintenance such a big piece of it, you know. So if you're going to put pieces on it, I would assume that there would be smaller pieces and you, you don't have that much of maintenance. And if some damage comes, you know, it's a small, smaller piece. But if you're trying to do that much wall that's, that's decorative, that's going to be pretty spendy. Well, so the, the wall is going to be built of concrete no matter what. And, and we can choose the pattern that they stamp into the concrete. We right. think with just a modicum of cost, this isn't, we're not going to call this art. We're not going to call it expensive. We're just going to say, we have a chance to make this wall better than boilerplate. And <laughs> we're trying to explore those ideas. Yeah. We have found, I think, and other agencies have found that the more texture you put on, the less compelling it is as a canvas for graffiti because it the 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 variation in the surface makes it hard it's not smooth it's just not as fun to tag and throw up a piece on a wall that's got a lot of texture and so we're, we're drawn towards the bigger bolder patterns um it, as part of of communicating this place but also as a part of uh dissuading uh folks from from damaging the piece right Great. Then, then, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, this is great. Um, I, and that's perfect. Um, I think this was the example that uh, James was talking about uh, where an, another approach would be to look at, you know, accentuating the height of that wall 
by doing something that treats this wall and breaks it up horizontally. Um, this is an example, just a, another way to kind of versus the wall that we just showed you where you're basically showing vertical elements and you're really recognizing that. This would be a way to break that up in terms of some sort of composition in the, and, and to make this having a little bit more, uh, a, different, a different form and a different structure. And I think one of the ideas that's nested in here is that you'd have the, the part of the wall that was closest to the moving vehicles and closest to sort of the roadway level would be rough. And it might be a pattern that is consistent project wide. But as you moved up the wall closer to where people might see it from the community, the treatments would become more and more special. They'd be different kinds of patterns. Um, that uh, would be those elements. We were talking about elements of consistency, elements of distinction. Um, this was trying to take something tall and break it down to scale um, and, and then still try to use some bold geometric patterns to avoid graffiti, but also to signal and, and to find those patterns that resonated with the Black American experience or the, the art and the pattern making um, that, that we've talked about before. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for reminding me. Um, you know, one of the things that we did, even when we were doing that Trader Joe's project, that it was really, it, it really became difficult to figure out. And we went all over the country and even to Africa to find out, find stencils and things that were representational of Black building and, uh, or Black community or someone's impression of what these types of the crowns, for example, on tops of buildings, how most developers or most builders would put a crown that was sig signifies their label of some kind, their type of building. But, you know, we, we, we finally found some places and some organizations come one of them out of Chicago and a few other who are doing some of this art and who understand how to make these, these stencils that, that are culturally representational. Right. And that was kind of a, a real, a real um, surprise or a real um, treat to be able to find them. And finally, we were able, and then colors, color combinations, you know, they're totally different. Um, and one of the things that we did learn about with art and design on some of these buildings were the colors of buildings, the design of buildings, they're more like beacons. And, you know, and the types of communities, you can tell they're representational all over the place. You'll be able to find, you know, this beacon, these types of buildings that attract certain kinds of people in communities. And so colors are in, in building structures and, and the way that they're built are, are real important. Uh, and, and I don't want to stress enough to how if it's going to be representational of a cultural specific types of type of situation, believe me, you're going to have to marry these things to, to make it look complete, you know? And so, so good luck with that one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all got your work cut out for you on that one. Hey, we know we need help and we're looking for our voices to help us, so. I find it interesting how Mr. Washington says, good luck with that, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> He's been so engaged, but suddenly he is trying to take a pause. Well, asking, you know, John. that's OK, sugar. You know, I mean, sister, because I know that they are out there. I just think that it's like a hunting a rare elk or some kind. You know, I don't know if I got that hunt left in me, but I, <laughs> but I will load the guns for you, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. So, but yeah, I, I, you know, I would. It would be my pleasure to help out with what those patterns really actually look at in the conversations that the types of conversations that elicit people's support with these types of patterns. It, it's a real unique deal because a lot of our community don't understand this beacon, these kinds of conversations about how important it is for you to marry development in the community, in a culture, in a community. We don't talk about that that much, but it's really important that people begin to understand that they have to lean into this type of dialogue. Thank you, John. That's the direction we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. And then James uses this last slide just re represents more of what you talked about of the, the uh, simple, more um, uh, down low is much more appropriate for somebody being in the car and then higher up is a much more refined, more delicate look. Um, and these are just some examples of what that patterns that, that, that kind of fall into that. And these are all kind of industry standards, things that are very easily found on the, in the, um, the marketplace for these kind of walls. One of the conversations we do intend to have is with the builders to find out what is possible. Do we have to use industry standards? Would they 
would they find custom things preferable, which sometimes they do because they're going to be building the form or custom. So, so we intend to have that conversation. So the next time we come back to you, we got a, a, a tighter suite of, of proposals and we've got some grounding that we know the builder can build it. Right. And, and to be aware that that concrete can be dyed in colors, you know, so that it's important that you do have not only texture, but you have color and concrete. So it's a wide range of opportunities you have with it. So, Great point. Thank you. Any, are there any preferences? I mean, we, we are presenting, you know, we keep it simple and vertical. We accentuate the horizontal or we have moments of specialness. Are there any preferences, preferences amongst y'all about those ideas? Because I think we're looking at one wall, but I think it's true that what we learn on this one wall will apply to the way we make the other walls uh, on the project especially as we talk about the consistency and the distinctiveness of certain locations that all kind of fits together. Or is there anything more that, that, that they have members need to kind of help them make a decision or give us more feedback? Great question. Have members, are you all having particular thoughts towards vertical or horizontal panels? So we'll help the urban design team as they move forward to present things to you. Um, I don't particularly have much of a concern about the horizontal patterns or the vertical patterns because they're gonna all be contiguous and they're gonna be the same replica replications, not unless we do something different with that. As Bryson said earlier, my only concern is, is that there's just not murals paint it someplace that have a short lifespan, you know, and that can be altered. So whatever we do as an art piece or anything, it should be a fixed piece that can be taken down in maintenance if it has to be maintenance or whatever the case may be. But it, it, it's some a structure that's a solid structure and it's, and it's uh, protected some way. Um, but as far as these stamps are concerned, I think a lot of that's going to be when, when they can bring these types of stamp examples in front of us, I think we'll have a whole lot more opportunity to be more engaged with it when we can touch, feel, see the, the, the type of designs and the ideas in which they're going to use. But definitely not boilerplate, okay, because, uh, you know, that's not representation of who we are. The boilerplate is just that beacon of attracting the same communities that it's always attracted. So we're gonna to need to figure out a way to be a little bit more dynamic and innovative in that pattern and design in which we do. Mr. Edwards, I see your hand. I, I tend to like the vertical, um, but I, and I think the, the, the main thing that I like about the vertical is because it, um, I think there's more um, opportunity to have um, some variety in what we're offering there, rather than having, um, you know, a, a consistent art piece. Like I say, I I'm I wanted to to have to think about the um, the um, seven principles of, of Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. That, that, that's valuable uh, to me, and um, I think it's valuable to our community, and it speaks to, like I say, so much about who we should, who we are, and what we should be about. And I think that needs to be said, art is wonderful. Art is great, but art is um, like they say, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But when they see statements like um, um, Umoja, Ujima, Ujima, and um, you know, all of the other principles of Kwanzaa, I think that speaks and people start thinking about what they should be about. And that's, that's, that's a critical piece for our community because we, we get that one week out of the year and, and the whole community doesn't get it. But not only does our community get it, but everybody that rolls through there will get it and know who we are and what we are about. Because we're not about all this foolishness that we've been doing um, up here in America, shooting each other and selling drugs to each other and pimping our women and all that old craziness. That's not who we are. And I want something that, that will tell us, tell everybody 
about where we came from, what we're about, and who we are. I want them to see us. And they're not going to see us through art. That's all great and wonderful. Everybody's got their, every culture has their art. That's, a, that's, that's all, that's wonderful. But I want to get back to everybody understanding, us understanding especially, but everyone else understanding, knowing who we are and what we're about. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Ms. Keith. I'm going to move us along because okay. there's another side to this wall. Um, and, and it is the side that faces the school. And just a little bit of framing um, uh, for you. The, the wall is really, really long. And the part of the wall that faces the school that is really visible from the school uh, yard is relatively short. So shown in red here, this is the school, and there's the highway as it is today. Um, the wall that you would see from the school is this sort of uh, L shape. And there's a little bit of a segment of the wall that you'll see from Flint. And those are the places that we want to talk primarily about. This extent of the wall is actually down the hill and will be probably obscured by landscape. So, so this is the, if you can see this drawing, this is the school and there's this sort of tight space around 26 feet and then the wall would be right there sort of front and center but a little bit further away the wall's way down the slope and so it's a little bit less important from our perspective in terms of its face to the community it's going to be hidden for the most part so uh, with that little bit of context again we have four ideas for what does the wall look like as it faces the school and Marianne will step us through those and she's been so patient mm -hmm. could you go back up to the plan view Absolutely. Yeah, just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, as James said, you'll see the wall um, from the school, the back of the school in the area where you can see that there's no trees between the school and the wall. Um, in areas where the wall moves away, um, we have more space, we'll be able to get in vegetation. And one of the things that we are doing as the landscape architects on the project is really working toward to um, uh, put in as many trees as we can um, between the, the school and, and the freeway um, where there is the, definitely the room for it. So this is actually based on um, our construction drawings as Steve mentioned earlier, we've already submitted um, our 60% drawings for early work package A um, which is uh, a little bit further north of this, but we are moving forward in, in designing a lot of these areas now. So um, as James said, um, from the back of the school, you're gonna see this wall, it's 12 feet high, but as you move further to the north, um, the, the slope goes down and so that, that uh, wall would be down below. So we've looked at a couple ideas of what we could do with this wall. And um, these, are just, these are just a few ideas and you know, we can come up with new ideas tonight or you can think about it. Um, this, is a, this is an idea of a historical mural. Um, one of the things that it, we could consider is a mural. Maybe it, it isn't there forever. Maybe the mural is there temporarily. It's, it's for a year or two. And then we get another artist in with a different vision of what they want to pr propose and provide, or maybe it's a different historical vision, or maybe it's, it's, it's um, a whole different viewpoint. Um, so this is what you would see from the back of the school, this wall, and then this dashed line that goes across there to the right is basically the elevation at the back of the school. And so I put that line in so you can see that the wall drops down and then there's gonna be trees and, and we're gonna put a lot of shrubs in there. So you really aren't gonna see the wall that much as it drops below. But where it's 12 feet high at the back of the school, you're definitely gonna see it. So moving down the options that we've shown here, um, this is another option where we might, we might do paintings. Um, I actually got these images off of the um, Harriet Tubman Middle School art um, page, which was very exciting on the school. They show student artwork now. Um, so maybe that's an opportunity that we could have a temporary, it's like a temporary art gallery. Um, yearly, they could have kids um, propose and have maybe their artworks uh, produced onto this wall. And then we have the opportunity to have some landscaping in there as well, bring some landscaping in, um, in front of the wall. Um, moving down further, and I just wanna to say too, 
on those that we just saw. That could be a, a mural. Uh, that could be a mosaic, as we've mentioned before in some re- earlier conversations tonight. So it doesn't have to be painted. It could be could be other things. So um, other options are things. Uh, this is a green wall, and we had talked about this a while ago at very early, early stages. Uh, we could grow vines on that wall and have a vertical garden uh, with plant material in front of that and pretty much obscure that. This is kind of a rendition of if we put um, Boston ivy, which t- is a deciduous plant, which t- turns red um, in the fall. And uh, so there would be kind of the dynamic uh, a- aspects of that. Um, and then lastly, we looked at. Um, putting some sort of decorative panel. Now, Bill had brought that up earlier, bringing in a panel that might have um, texture, maybe it is a pattern that is culturally relevant. Um, We could have that up there. You could have shadows from the sunlight or it could be backlit as we discussed before. Um, So I guess, uh, you know, do any of these seem interesting? Do you have other ideas? Are there some that you just absolutely don't like? You know, help us help us to start winnowing down some of the options that that are available to all of us. We're or asking questions. <laughs> Absolutely, have members. I know uh, many of us is our beloved Terry at Tubman and thinking about what uh, the community facing side of that wall would um, be. I know Mr. Modica mentioned um, something earlier. So are there others of you who have additions, thoughts? I see uh, Ms. Sharon Gary Smith. I can wait in order. Did I hear you say a name before me? No, ma'am. I'm oh, uh, okay. your first. <laughs> you know, I think the significance of Harriet Tubman won and the significance of our school, Harriet Tubman. Um, it makes me think of a wayfinder and kind of the um, based on its placement regardless of where it goes, that it actually is the signal and the entering of the community or the passing by, even if the site is no longer inhabited by a school, school students. So I like the idea of something that pays homage to them. Um, When I saw that Marianne was showing some student art, I don't know if it could be something purposeful about those, many of those students have been actively involved and what makes sense about this I-5 Rose Quarter to them, whether it's livability, environmental quality, all of those things that have caused us to pause. And so I would like something that kind of elevates and lifts up that, I'm gonna call it sacred spot, where children are learning or want to be in an environment that allows learning. So I like something around murals, whether it's those that have already been developed or those that are specifically developed given the timeline to announce that Harriet Tubman School, middle school was here and is here in this ground as people are passing by some of the history lesson uh, that others have raised as well. I also wonder if uh, Mary Ann was showing us when I'm on freeways and I'm traveling, there are often times where you want something that actually gives you a sense of being contented and not frazzled and harried as freeway travel typically creates. So something that actually gives me a moment to pause and reflect, to remember, um, to be soothed. And I'd love the students work to be able to embody that. So that's just my thinking about it. Thank you. Mr. Washington, I see your hand. As usual, Ms. Gehring paints with such a wide swash that she reaches and touches on a lot of areas <laughs> and she stole some of my thoughts, but that's mm-hmm. okay, sister, I don't mind you. Um, you know, is, for me with this side of the wall, uh, again, and I don't want the, the, the lady who, who just described this to take this personal, but some of this passive approach to how we place information in our communities and how we do this and these murals, I don't know if people get it. It's, it's just a temporary, as it's been said, a temporary placeholder. But what does that really mean? I mean, but if we're going to be intentional about something, let's be real intentional about it. 
and let's make sure that we put pieces up there that are going to have a, a, a sustaining longevity to them. And but here's the big part of this conversation for me is what's important is as long as as long as students and community people are passing through and being able to see, see this, whatever is there, I wanted to somehow another add to the enrichment and, and inspiration of the people who see it. And if young people are going to be observing this thing, then I wanted to somehow or another constantly be educating them to the next iteration of our life and of our communities and those types of things. So whatever goes there, it, it, for me, it just needs to be inspiring and enriching for our community. And so however that pattern shows itself up and however that reaches us, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, room for how we uh, interpret that, but I think the important part is, is as long as it's enriching and it's enriching our young people and moving them in the right direction, I'm all for it. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Other thoughts from CAB members? I think James is showing you kind of those decorative attachments uh, as well as we've seen that. We've talked about uh, youth art, commissioned art pieces, other preferences or thoughts? As you think about that, I feel like I, I'm hearing we need to honor Harriet Tubman as a figure that just happens to be at a wall near Harry Tubman Middle School. And it needs to have permanence and intention and vision and aspiration. And that, those are words that I think of when I think of a commissioned art piece. Maybe this is something of substance. It is applied to the wall after, but the wall is designed ready to receive it. And it is, it's important and it is permanent and it is beautiful. And that's not something that we all maybe have the skill to do, but we would know it when we saw it. If we, if we collaborated with an artist who said on this 75 feet of wall, that's 12 feet high, this is the story that we could tell. And all our project would need to do would be to set the table for that, as Bill had said earlier. Um, is that, it, I mean, that sounds, that, that I feel I'm trying to reflect what I think I'm hearing. It's not, yeah, let's grow stuff on the wall and hide it. It's, uh, it's, no, let's inspire these students in perpetuity with something of substance and uh, of quality, real quality. From, from, uh, from what, you know, just listening to John's words um, and, you know, not really being from Portland, but having been here a while, it, it made me really understand the significance of the Harriet Tubman School and what has happened to that what that place has done over the last 50 years in terms of the black community. Protests, things that have happened that all focused around Harriet Tubman Middle School that went back year, you know, 40 years ago that I think is, John, this is a perfect opportunity here. We've got a place here to talk about something that will stand forever and pay tribute to what has happened and the people that helped shape some of the things at that time and continue to do so. If I could, I, I would like to say that, um, you know, Kevin mentioned earlier that um, Tubman is not probably not going to remain there. It's probably going to move to another location. <clears throat> so I would like to see that wall not only reflect Harriet Tubman, but other Black women that have been very significant, not only in our community, but in our nation um, toward um, our, our fight toward justice and freedom. Um, Sojourner Truth comes to mind, um, Madam C.J. Walker, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Maya Angelou, um, their um, uh, sister Barbara Jordan. There are, are many Black women that have played significant roles in our, um, in our growth, in our progression. And I would rather see that wall, not only about Harriet Tubman, because then that when you say Harriet Tubman, then you, you, you leave out all the other sisters. And uh, maybe we can't put all the sisters on the wall, but certainly we can put more than just one. And that's what I would like to see. Because like I say, when Harriet Tubman's gone, you know, then we're gonna, just gonna be left with Harriet Tubman on that wall and not the other sisters that have contributed it as well. So I, I, that's what I would like to propose is that 
you know, we have black women all across that wall that represent um, um, a lot more than um, than just one, because there's there's more than just one. Thank you. I think we also should recognize Leslie's comment in the chat uh, that the school before it being Harriet Tubman was Elliot. I know my parents met there in the third grade. So there is a lot of history before it was named Harriet Tubman. Thank you for sharing that. Bryson, I see your hand. Yeah, so you know, I, I hesitate a little bit because I think what I'm thinking about is probably it was definitely on the on the expensive end, but kind of hearing the comments, um, hearing what Keith just said, and thinking about you know how can we make this more more permanent, but still kind of acknowledge and uh, pay tribute to the people we want to pay tribute and. Thinking about kind of how, you know, Mount Rushmore has the carvings and stone of people's faces along um, a panel. Wondering if there, if this could be a commission thing where we've got um, basically a carving of people along a panel, um, and, you know, may, whether it's concrete added a, in addition to the wall or concrete that's added, that's carved into the wall itself, but that could provide a lot of permanence and then provide us a way to kind of give a space for each of the figures that we wanted to, wanted to recognize. Just a couple of thoughts on that. And um, the first is the space that we would be doing this work in has sort of a, um, it's, it's sort of a working space, right? It's, it's vehicles circulate through there in addition to being a school space. Um, and so I think we'll just want to be aware of what, what kind of program is happening and what kind of uh, protection would be needed to preserve something as, as precious as a commissioned piece of artwork. Um, so, so the, the, but, but all of what we're talking about here is the project will set the table for something special to happen. The what is the brief for the something special? That that can take time to mature. We, we have time for that. All we have to do is get the wall ready to receive some kind of other attachment. If, in fact, we move towards a commissioned art piece, you'll see if we have time later that that certainly this school location, whether it remains a school or not, it's likely to remain as a civic institution. How we how the project responds to it um, is probably worthy of one of these premier areas of investment and treatment. Um, and we can shape that later. And I think that's what we're hearing. And that's what we needed to hear tonight is that um, these are exciting ideas where we wanted something of quality and permanence that's kind of beyond the, the design palette of an infrastructure project. We want something special. And that is enough for us to make the wall ready to receive something special. Mm -hmm. And then we can work with Megan and others to stand up like the art program, how we might actually do that uh, and where we would actually do it. So I'm, I feel like we're, we're receiving enough uh, feedback today about how, how important this is. Now, I'm, I do have the screen, but I want to ask Miss Erica, we have 15 minutes remaining. I'll zoom out just to share with you. We did have a conversation about uh, locations of storytelling, locations of historic uh, acknowledgement and maybe contemporaneous commissioned artwork. That might be, we've been dabbling in that conversation, so maybe it's not so important to have it right now. Um, and we may just have run out of time. We also have two areas that are uh, that are important to us because they're up next in the schedule, um, and they're related to the the bridge and the undercrossing and the spaces that are created at the southern end of the project near the Oregon Convention Center, both the Lloyd uh, Boulevard undercrossing where we have had some ideas for a while, um, and the Oregon undercrossing, which is actually the street that you would drive through uh, when you got off the steel bridge. So we can tackle either, both, or none, depending on uh, Ms. Erica's advice. James, thank you. Uh, Mr. Washington, I see your hand. Um, I would say it, it, it is uh, important to mention to this group, because there have been questions about that uh, the design team is recognizing several places 
uh, where there's opportunity for art. Uh, and um, I don't know how far deep we were uh, planning to talk about that, but I think it would be great just to mention. i um, not sure if Megan had an update there. And then for us to maybe talk deeper uh, in regards to early work package B at our next scheduled urban design forum. That, that would certainly work for, for us. Indeed. So, so do we want to take Mr. Washington's question and then I can, I can talk a little bit about art and Megan, Megan can support that? Absolutely. Mr. Washington. Thank you. Um, just uh, the last thing. And one of the things that, uh, that's a little bit concerning for us in the district and, and hopefully we can get that in some of this design conversation and that, but signage. You know, uh, things that direct us to these pieces and environments and the overall signage of the Seoul District and the North Northeast and making sure that there's consistency in directions as to how we to engage and involve ourselves with these projects and then where they're located and then points of entry access all that stuff so Hopefully, this just a placeholder. <laughs> I like that word every once in a while. <laughs> a placeholder. Just that thought about how we're going to organize that signage reality as to getting uh, communications out about the importance of these things and how to direct people. That's a great point. Overarching wayfinding in both the district as it is today and the district as it will be in the future yeah. is somewhat distinct from art, somewhat distinct from telling our history, your history. Um, it is, but it is, a, it's an important piece. And it's not just roadway signage that you're talking about, Mr. Washington. No, it's like pointing signs and directional, right? Yeah. Um, I, I will take that as an action. Um, if, if I could, um, excuse me for interrupting, but I just want to be real clear that. We understand that ODOT doesn't have the total say so about what comes after and what comes um, adjacent to uh, the coverings. Um, but at the same time, we want to be real clear again that we, we expressed this early on that we expect ODOT to advocate for whatever we want. Um, and we want that to be heartfelt and sincere and true. So I just want to be real clear about that. I want that, you know put in the record so that, you know, we're not saying that, you know, ODOT, you know, is, is controlling this, but at the same time, we want ODOT to know that they're going to be right lockstep with us advocating for whatever we want as a community. Right yep, now, and I'll, I'll just you. jump in and, and <laughs> say, uh, yes, uh, you know, as the HAB, you know, that's exactly why we're here, um, making sure that we're, you know, standing with you shoulder to shoulder, supporting the recommendations from the community. Uh, as we go forward. So yes, Keith, thanks for bringing that up again. Thank you. James, if you would just briefly um, speak to um, oh. our conversations around the design piece and the art uh, potential for our program. Yeah. So the urban design team, Bill, Marianne, myself, and the others that support us, sort of have, we, we span two worlds. We have these high level conversations with you all and then we have to go tell the contractor to do a specific thing at column number 37 and do this. Like, so that's the tension that we navigate. And we have been tracking our conversations with you and documenting in a spreadsheet all of the places and locations where something better can be done, whether it's putting tile on a column, painting a column, whatever it is. Um, we're keeping track of it and trying to... Um, make sure that these things that we talk about happen on the project. That is our, that's our, um, our mandate. A lot of what we talked about tonight is stuff that we would characterize as integrated into the project. We will take your ideas, push them into construction documents and have the contractor build them, whether it's a light bulb, whether it's paint color, whatever. But there are also the things like we just talked about at uh, the middle school, that are art, they're standalone, there's something different, there's something special beyond the realm of the, uh, of the design team. And so what we, based on uh, conversations that we have had with you, we have an initial idea about where those moments of specialness and 
additional investment can occur. Imagine that we're going to integrate a lot of the things we've talked about across the project area. What are the places on the project where the most people will see them? And I think that's what we're uh, putting forward to you now is, is the beginnings of a conversation that Russell is an area of special investment. If we were to get art, we might try to spend some of our art money and resource near Russell because that is a place that's both historically important, but it's a place where people are moving. Actual people, not just people in cars, but people. The same is true at Harry Tubman Middle School, which is confirmed by our conversation today. That is a special place in the project area where the project can do something. The third is clearly on the covers, and we haven't been talking together with you about the covers, but whether it is the streets or the plazas or whatnot on the covers, it's clearly an area where something special can happen. And the other, um, we talked once upon a time about the Pillars of Albina down here at the Rose Quarter Transit Center, a place where there's lots of people on game day and just every day, there's lots of people moving in and around, actual people on foot engaging with the infrastructure. And that is a place where we could put a premium level of treatment and investment. So that's the beginnings of the conversation, but I want you to be aware that we're trying to push content and integrate it, but we're also recognizing the need for maybe an art collaboration or art program um, that identifies these areas that are special even more. And that's, that's really just what we wanted to say about it. We've been, we've been touching on that conversation, dabbling on that conversation throughout the night. And James, I'll just build on that. You know, I think, uh, as you, as you mentioned, you know, the feedback that we're receiving from this committee, uh, we're, you know, taking to heart and tracking and making sure that it's being incorporated. And I think part of our responsibility, um, as we, as we go through this iterative process as well, is being really clear on what are the elements that are integrated, you know, inherently within the project, and what are the elements that would would require those additional partnerships um, uh, with, you know, uh, community organizations um, or artist groups, uh, or otherwise. And so I think we we owe that um, level of specificity back to the HAB as well as we're working through um, these details moving forward. Um, but definitely excited. I'm like. It's, this is a wonderful meeting. It was so exciting to hear all of the feedback from the group, um, but excited to see where we can take some of these elements and really, again, reflect the community uh, in our work moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Megan. James, uh, Bill, Marianne, thank you all for your work, your commitment. Um, it's a pleasure to um, work with you all uh, and to see your passion for uh, community vision. And so I would love for us and those who have capacity from the HAB uh, to participate and to continue this conversation around Early Work Package B in our uh, design collaboration forum that is coming up uh, in March. Uh, so uh, thank you all for being here and presenting. Um, it really is exciting. Uh, thank you, HAB, for your commitment and uh, your contribution here today. Uh, Ms. Natalie, if you would put up um, the slides for me, please. Thank you. So for our next steps, um, as you heard from Megan earlier today, they're continuing to work through as the uh, initial IGA uh, has been signed. And so now those partnerships um, with Sydney and others uh, who need to be intricately involved continue to be developed. And so we'll continue to update uh, you uh, as we move forward there. Um, advance of the highway cover design and the updated NEPA and environmental assessment. Uh, you heard Steve talk about that uh, towards uh, the fall of 2022. Uh, and then um, as the design team is working to finalize uh, early work package designs. Uh, next slide, please. We will uh, be working um, with you all and the design collaboration forum that will be coming up on March 8th at two o'clock. Uh, so for those of you who have capacity on the HAB to join in that more in-depth conversation, uh, we welcome you. We know there are some who have committed to that, but it is open to the entire uh, HAB group to participate there. Also, for those who have capacity to join uh, and celebrate with the COAC, on Thursday the 17th, their meeting is at four o'clock uh, where they will be celebrating uh, the approval and rollout of the diversity plan uh, for this project. Uh, I want to uh, appreciate all of you for sharing your evening with me. Uh, we do not take for granted uh, your commitment uh, of time, your investment, 
and uh, Miss Megan. Thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. <laughs> oh, Erica, thank you. And um, this is a, kind of a non-Rose Porter related item, uh, but does uh, kind of build upon my comments around the finance plan and um, upcoming infrastructure investment and jobs act conversations. So wanted to have just to be aware uh, that ODA is engaging um, conversations statewide around um, the federal infrastructure investment and jobs act and really what that investment means for Oregonians. Um, so we're starting to increase awareness around the, um, the federal act and um, conducting, there's going to be a community survey that's part of this effort. And so the information from that survey will be provided to the Oregon Transportation Commission uh, at their upcoming meeting in March. So you, um, as, as an advisory committee uh, to ODOT, uh, we will also make you aware of this community survey should you be interested um, or have capacity to participate, to be on the lookout for an email. Um, and again, this is being organized from ODOT's uh, Office of Social Equity to engage uh, broader community participation in that conversation. So um, thank you and be on the lookout for that message coming soon. Awesome, thank you, Megan, we appreciate that. I encourage, I know that for many HAB members uh, and um, others uh, on the staff, this is Black history is every day for us and not just a month. Uh, I would encourage those community members who are listening in and our project staff and partners to engage and avail yourself to all of the activities and um, history and lessons. Uh, engage yourself in some deeper conversations and finding ways to um, connect. Uh, there are more things uh, about us that are alike than different. Uh, I appreciate any of your investments uh, in education around Black History Month. Uh, and there are several events, uh, even that the uh, Rose Quarter Project will be participating in um, and uh, carrying throughout the project. So uh, thank you, enjoy your evening, and we will convene again in March.